Welcome, everyone. Continue to have lunch, and I want to sort of ease us into continuing conversations, because I love that we're seeing each other for, like, again, some of us have seen each other already, but some of us, it's been about a month. So we're going to start with student engagement strategies, and to sort of kick us off, I want to keep the conversation going in your tables with your new friends. So when you think of student engagement, <sighs> You can't throw anything and not hit something that says student engagement or active learning or something along these lines. So with your table partners, let's just start opening up conversation about what does that mean? Like, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Some of us are coming right out of grad programs. Some of us have taught for a little while or a long while. Some of us have not taught. So you can kind of come at it from the student or the faculty perspective. But just sort of start that conversation at your tables. What does, this, what does it mean to us? Go. <laughs> I was like, it was really, really nice and chatty. And they got real quiet. I appreciate it. And I'm like, now start chatting again. And again, if you're sitting down, make sure that you introduce yourself, because we'll be seeing a lot of each other over the next couple months. And you're coming in. What's your name? Charles. Charles. This is Charles. What's your um department? Uh, uh, College of Business. College of Business. Okay. This is sort of what we're talking about right now. Yeah. All right, so if we could if we could sort of bring this back, what are a couple words to describe what student engagement sounds like? Interaction, participation. Right, it's definitely not quiet in those classrooms, right? Um, unless you're running like sciency lab and you're pouring acid with acid, sometimes you got to sort of pay attention there. What does it look like? Yeah. Oh well, I was gonna say we were actually talking about like trying to push our own assumptions of what it sounds mm -hmm. like. That, like free rights and like kind of active puzzling can be science. Okay. And that that can still be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of us who are in one of the two writing groups, right? There's going to be like a hi, what's your goal, state your intention, and then t -t -t -t, let's all write. <laughs> so it's going to be a very active hour, but it's going to be probably be a very quiet hour, with the exception of tap 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 on the on the mm -hmm. keyboard, right? What does it feel like? For those of you who have taught before, what does engagement feel like as a faculty member? For me, energizing. Energizing, right? I'm an introvert. Introvert, big introvert. When I leave a class that has gone well, I feel like Superman, Superwoman, Captain Marvel. I'm like, yes, totally energized. As opposed to usually I leave social situations like, I need a nap. That was exhausting, right? As a student, when you've been in 
a class that has gone well on the student side, what does that feel like? Effortless. Effortless, right? You feel like you're contributing. You feel like you're contributing. Thank you. Yes. You're being heard. And more excited about the stuff. Right? It's sort of like learning begets learning. Enthusiasm begets enthusiasm. It's sort of thanks to our folks in physics that so like that concept of inertia, things in motion stay in motion, so you, you get more excited about things. So we really wanted to, again, some of these programs that we're doing for the next five weeks um, are just meant to be light in programming, heavy in community building. We want y'all to get together to feel like you have this cohort on campus. And I've already seen like here, oh, we've got five different areas represented in our side of the table, or we've got you know all the colleges represented here. Um, this one on student engagement, some of you have been doing this. Some of you might already be doing this. Some of you might be really struggling with this whenever we put any kind of workshop on, whether it's faculty or grad students. The number one thing is like, how do I get them to care? Or how do I get them to learn? Or how can I make sure that I'm not boring sort of thing? And so for some reason, whenever we talk student engagement, it is always somehow antithetical to lecturing. <laughs> Lecturing is put up there on sort of, it's like the sacrificial lamb. It's like lecturing cannot be interesting, it cannot be entertaining, it cannot be fun, it cannot be engaging. And right, there is a real tension there. Because a lot of times we as faculty, we want to lecture, that's how we're gonna get our stuff across. But it's viewed sort of negatively and so we don't wanna be the one to lecture, but we lecture for a number of reasons. One, students prefer it when we lecture. They have been raised that way. It's familiar to them. And so for those of you who have been teaching for a while, the more you do active engagement and the less you do lecturing in the classroom, sometimes that comes around to bite you in your student evals. Because students don't think of active engagement as learning. They equate lecturing with learning, right? And so if you're not a lecturer in your class, they're like, how about you lecture more so we can learn? And you're like, but but these activities, I've spent hours of my life designing these activities and you're learning. And they're like, no, we're not learning anything in there. right? So there is this tension of like, well, I, I want to get it across to them, but how can we do that? right? So we want to sort of ground ourselves before we jump into strategies. We want to sort of ground ourselves with the question of what are we doing? Because you really have to ground yourself with that. What is your goal? What is your student learning outcome? So when you show up on Monday, or when you show up and you're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're trying to cover chapter two this week, what's the goal? And then you want to sort of align that with the time you spend in classroom. So have students do the thing that gives them practice so that they can meet the goal. Right? And so if that is lecturing, then you need to lecture. If it is a demonstration, you need to do that. But you need to prioritize the materials that lead to outcomes. Right? Um, because the time and the energy that you spend in class on something is a direct reflection of its importance. And this is where students get confused. Sometimes we'll focus a lot on one thing, and there will be one question on the exam. And they're like, I thought this was way important, and I studied it for hours. And it was one question. Right? Whereas when they're doing the activities, they're, they're not seeing that that's going to be on the test. When I teach research methods, I give them lots of like, handouts to do in group work because research is something you do. And they don't believe me, but I'm like, the handout, you, the questions on the test are going to look like the questions on the handout. They're going to be a little bit different. You can't just memorize the handouts. But this is how we do research methods. You develop a hypothesis. You design a study. You test the results. And they're like, huh, I was like, did you think I was lying when I give them back their test? Like, it was exactly the handout, right? You also, I give you permission to consider what you can drop and drop it. Consider what you can downplay or move out of class and do that. Because I think, especially as newer teachers, right? If you have taught before, if you taught at a grad, when you were in grad school, you're like, well, I've got to teach the book. There's 16 chapters. I've got to teach all 16 chapters. And every chapter is equally valuable. And every word in every chapter needs to be, no, that's erroneous, right? You have academic freedom. You can present what you want. And you can tell them what is important to you, right? So I will tell them, hey, this is really interesting. Not on the exam. Or hey, this is wrong. Don't do this part. Or wait for it, chapter this, I don't like it. We're not going to cover it. Because it's my class, and I can do that. 
that, right? Now, I try not to do too much of that, because it's one thing if you have them by the book and you only use half the book. But you can ditch the things that aren't important, or you can make students do things outside of class. That's part of what they're supposed to be doing. Now, again, it should be something that they can do by themselves outside of class, but you can ask them to work outside of class. So sometimes you'll say, I'm going to have you practice this at home. We're going to do this in class today, right? So what are the this is? Some of this is lecturing. Lecturing is not a bad word. It's not boring. It can be very, very, very engaging, right? But you have to do it right. We've all seen the sort of Bueller, Bueller, Bueller approach where you're just like mind-numbingly putting them all to sleep. Or you've been in that class when you've been like rocked to sleep by just ever, like nothing is exciting. So there's a couple of things that we can do. You can pull in their knowledge. So thank you for saying when I've contributed, when I've added something to the class, that's what active learning looks like. Because students are coming in, even our freshmen are coming in with 17, 18 years of knowledge and experience. That's wealth. Let's bring all that in. They know a lot of stuff. Now, we're there to teach them our stuff, but they can, they can add to that conversation too. Ask open-ended questions so that you can't just shut them down. Right? What's the answer? That's fine. If it's math and there's a real answer, 13, <laughs> whatever, that's cool. But if not, it's like, what are we feeling about x, y, and z? Right? I've got one up here and one over there. There we go. Yeah. Um, then we all have the things that we're aware of. So the think pair shares, the small group share outs, the fish bowls, those things that are active. But you don't have to save a whole class session for them. You can plop them into things. So when you know we started this and I said, discuss in your groups what this looks like, sounds like, you know, that's more of the small group share out. We have those. We can actually do responses and polling too. So it's a little um, more interactive, but on the sort of tech side of things. So we can do clickers. Um, we now have a site license, uni a university-wide site license to poll everywhere that integrates with your classroom. So you can use that. And the folks at ITS are there to help you integrate that and learn how to use that. There's lots of good tutorials online. But it can be you know, a check. There's a multiple choice quiz. And you have them log in and do the quiz questions so you get real time answers. You can also do opinion polls. right? I love Poll Everywhere. I love their word clouds. They're so pretty. They're just dynamic. And they float all around. You're like, oh, ooh, the word is getting bigger. Oh, it's shrinking now. What's happening with the word? So you can do that in the middle of lecturing. right? Then we have these active learning strategies, which aren't lecture, but we can do them instead of or in addition to lecture. So some of our fields have experimentation right, or simulations of things that we want them to learn. Do that. The key is transparency. You need to tell them why you're doing it, because a lot of times they'll see the thing that you're doing, and they don't understand that they've learned anything by watching you do it. So if you are in a science field and you want to run an experiment, Predict what's going to happen and then do it, and then debrief and show how you've related this to their learning, right? So that they understand. There's another thing like when you show a, a TED talk, cool, they're entertained because high production value there, right? You don't have to recreate the wheel. I always let TED speak for me when, because I, like, I don't want to do that. Um, but then afterwards, right, I'll either set them up with some guiding questions to think about, or afterwards I debrief with some debrief questions to show them how it is they learned in those 14 minutes. What did we learn? Because oftentimes in a textbook, they can underline things. But when they're watching a video, they don't know what they should be underlining, how they should be taking notes, what they should be getting from it. Right? Role playing is a big part of a lot of fields. So any kind of clinical work, social work, clinical psychology, counseling, um, teacher education, nursing, physical therapy. I don't want a nurse who's never talked to a pretend patient before, right? Like I want them to have pretended or actually talked to patients. And it helps with perspective taking and empathy building, right? And I think that's really important with our students because honestly, some of them are coming in 17, 18, 19 years old. They don't have the experience that someone who is older has had. And that's not a bad thing. That's just what they are in their lives, right? And so they need to kind of take perspective so that they can be a good nurse so that they can be a good practitioner, right? There's nothing worse than you know, when I teach clinical grad students, they walk in and someone is like, you're going to tell me how to fix my life? How old are you? Do you have kids? Have you been married? 
do you have substance problems? And they're looking at you like you can't possibly help them. It's like, well, maybe no to all of the things you just asked me, but I'm coming in with a different set of skills, right? But you have to be able to play that out. Then we have team-based and group-based learning. It's a catch-22 there. Most students hate it when you say group work. Most, some of us probably hate group work, right? But probably because there weren't clearly defined roles or accountability. Someone in the group did all the work. It's usually the one that hates the group work, right? But you can do group work well. And if you're transparent about why you're doing it, you can set your students up to say, in the real world, you have to work with others. Practicing that skill now in a nice, safe environment where I can help you and defuse anything, where the stakes aren't so high that if you don't succeed with your group, you're going to lose your job. Like, this is the time to learn how to do that. You can also take the team-based or group-based learning to like peer review. Put more peer review into your class that will help you with the grading, right? And it will help build bonds with your students. So it's sort of a, a double approach there. But there's also disciplinary ideas. So um, I will show you the Canvas site. But you can type in teaching of and whatever your field is. And there's probably a journal or lots of journals in that, right? We have the teaching of psychology. Very big journal. Lots of articles. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can check the literature to see how people in your field are teaching certain things in your field, right? So with us in psychology, we've got lots of stats and methods. Everyone is afraid of those classes. No one wants to take them. They're required for almost all undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees. So there's lots of like how to teach this in stats, how to teach this in methods, how to teach this in intro, how to teach this in insert the class here. So there's lots of that. I also want to change gears a little bit here. Instead of a specific strategy, thinking about our classrooms as this environment in which we can motivate our students, right? And so in psychology, in, in my field, social psychologists have studied a lot about motivation, what motivates people to learn, to want to do what we want them to do. And we are coming from an approach that uses GPS as a metaphor, right? We all know GPS to get you somewhere. Well, GPS stands for growth mindset, purpose and relevance, and sense of belonging. And the idea behind creating these mindsets is that you want to create a class environment where these mindsets are highlighted, where we can create a university environment where these are highlighted. Well, what do those mean? Um, with GPS messaging, we're going to talk about talking the talk here and then also walking the walk. So with messaging, most of us know about growth mindset. I can ask you, what is growth mindset? And you all spit it back to me. It's been in higher education. It's been in K through 12. When my daughter was in kindergarten, they all did this little like, chant and repeat thing where it's like, I haven't learned how to tie my shoes. And they all screamed, yet. And they're like, I don't know how to do multiplication. And they said, yet. And then one of them was like, I haven't skydived. And they said, yet. And I was like, why, why are we skydiving? <laughs> That's not the skill, right? Um, but we can talk all day about growth mindset, but you actually have to believe that. Your students know if you don't believe that they can learn something, right? And there's some, some of our fields that that is sort of assumed. So all of your STEMs, sorry STEMs, were in that field too. A lot of people in STEM think you're either born a math person or you're not. You're born a science person or you're not, right? The people who are like, I'm not good at math. No, 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 everyone can be good at math, but I'm not good at math, but you can be, right? So we want to, yes, I had one of my students one time that was like, I don't really like the stats or methods because I'm not good at math yet. And I was like, oh, it's happening in my office hours. She said yet. And then I emailed my collaborator and I was like, someone said yet in my office. It was beautiful. But you can put messages like that in your syllabus in your first day, right? In welcome emails or welcome videos, your first day of class, you can tell them everybody can learn everything in this class. Some of you might struggle. The struggle is part of it, right? Nothing should come easy if, if you're not challenging yourself, right? If you're not pushing. But we can also do growth emails for struggling students. So every time I give an exam, I email the Ds and Fs from exam one. And I'm like, you know, this might not have been the grade you wanted, but people get Ds and Fs on my first exam all the time and come back to ace the class, come back to really rock the class. It's all about learning. Come see me in office hours so we can see, like, how you studied, what happened with that first exam? Because some of them will straight say, like, I didn't open the book. 
and I didn't come to class and they'll own it. And others are like, I have this notes. And they're like, oh, those are not notes. You copied the textbook four times. Like that's not good, right? So we have that. We can also do personal relevance announcements and shares. So having them relate things from the class outside of the class. In some of our fields, it's really easy. Right? In some of the fields, you can say, here is where I see this in my life. Here is where you see it outside. Um, in others, it might take a little bit. Right? So I've seen some folks in engineering. There's somebody. I don't know who it is. I've heard it once from Thais. But um, someone shows like this animation of Pixar on the first day and then says, we're going to learn how to do all the stuff stuff to like make that happen. And I'm like, ooh, I love Pixar. Also, I can't do that, but like, if you're in that kind of engineering, you can learn how to do that thing, right? Or I'm going to create this styrofoam that's going to help whatever it is that you're doing, right? I don't know about those fields. Um, we can also do sense of belonging emails where we, we care about our students. I've noticed you haven't been to class. I noticed that you didn't turn in this assignment. Do you need some help doing that? I care about your grade in this class, right? And so we can set all of this up in how we're talking to the students. but. You also want to then, instead of just talk to talk, walk the walk, right? Your policies and what you're asking them to do in class should mirror that. My favorite is growth mindset. We talk about growth mindset all the time. And then do any of us allow our students to redo anything? Sometimes we don't. And that is, right, that, that doesn't align. I'm telling you you can grow, and then I'm not giving you the opportunity to grow in my class. What you did was your grade. So. We can frame your assignments. We can scaffold them. We can have drafts. We can have requests to redo things. They can be built into the assignment, or they can request to do it. Right? Um, exam wrappers are also a really good one where you ask students to think about what they did before the exam so that they kind of own their preparation for it or their lack of preparation for it. Because right? some of them will say, I didn't do the thing. So next time I need to do the thing, because otherwise I won't grow, I won't learn. Whereas others are like, well, I studied, but I studied all the wrong things, right? Those are two different students there. So with all of these, we want to be transparent about it. You want to tell them, I allow you to redo this paper because I want you all to grow and learn from your mistakes. Growth mindset, right? You can say those things. Purpose and relevance, again, you want to make the connections in class so to the degree that you can connect it with your personal life, with their personal life, with um, current events. Those are all good things to the degree that you can connect it with other classes. So if there's a prereq to your class, show them why they needed that before they got here. I love teaching methods because I'm like, you remember when you were doing stats by hand and they're all, and I'm like, sums of squares and they're shuddering in fear. I'm like, the computer does that for us now. Yeah. We don't do any of it, right? They're like, oh, cool. It's like, we're going to talk about the design of the study and what that is, not the stats. The stats you learned were good. So connect it with other classes, connect it with your major, with your field. For those of us who are teaching GE, this can be tricky because we're trying to sell our stuff to not our people. Right? So the students are like, why do I need to know algebra in my life? And you're like, well, you do. Here's why you do. Right? You remember that. I remember that in middle school. Someone's like, when will I ever need geometry? It's like, well, if you ever play billiards or if you're trying to play soccer and figure out where the ball goes, like. Angles are important. Yes, yeah. exactly. You buy the thing. People are like, well, this couch doesn't fit. You're like, mm, should have thought about that. Um, yeah. It's everywhere. It's our job to help them see that, though. There's also a sense of belonging. And we want our students to feel connected to our classrooms. right? We want them to feel connected to us as people. And if we've got a teaching team, if you've got TAs or SI instructors, whatever, you want them to feel connected. But you also want them to feel connected to each other. This is part of the reason why we don't just do this asynchronously and send you on your way. We want you to talk to each other so that you feel connected to other people on campus so that you're not coming back and be like, I'm going to go to my office by myself and work on my research alone. And then I'm going to come out of my office, teach my classroom alone, and then go back into my office and work alone. Right? Like, Maybe that's your jam. That might be very appealing to some of you, right? But most of us, we want to connect with others. So give them reasons to come to office hours. I put points on it. I'm like, I want you to come find me. Here's five points. Not everyone does. It's five points. It's not going to make their break their grade if they don't. But when they come, they're like, I'm like, see, here I am. Do you have a question? Or are you here for your points? They're like, I'm just here for my points. I was like, but see, if you have a question, 
you can come here again and I will answer the question. And then you get them coming back, right? You also want them to connect to other students. I like to have them talk in class, but I am transparent about that. I tell them at the beginning, research suggests you need to have a buddy in this class. So find a buddy. It could be your new best friend. It could just be the acquaintance where you're like, hey, it's the guy with the flowers on his shirt. That guy. Hey, you. They don't have to be best friends, but it's like something that, oh, hey, I didn't see you last week. How are you? They need to recognize each other and have that sort of acquaintanceship. So if you can connect it to class material, great. Give them opportunities to do that. But for those of you who picked up the yellow book during new faculty orientation, Jose Bowen's Teaching Change, that's one of the R's. It's the number one R in his three new R's. So not reading, writing, arithmetic. Relationships is the first one. We need to build those in class. I did want to bring your attention to the, if I can find my own cursor, there we go. OK, so in, there's now module two is open on the Canvas site. So for those of you who had the active, hopefully you all had a chance to read this again. It's just a little one. Um, so that one was published not too far off. Um, we have sort of redundantly put some of this stuff in so that our folks from like HHS is having a kickoff right now, so none of our folks from Health and Human Services are here today. But student engagement strategies, sort of the overview of this module. Um, here's what we talked about with lecturing and engagement. Here is what we talked about with engaging lectures and active learning strategies. Again, here are some of those teaching journals straight linked out um, with nursing. My gosh, there's like a billion nursing journals, nursing education journals, so many of them. Um, but like teaching of psychology, that's that's our folks. It's really fun to read that stuff. But you can, you know, you can find whatever it is for you. It can be as niche as like teaching in mechanical engineering versus like teaching engineering versus like teaching. There's lots of just general teaching ones too. I do want to put this caveat out. Just as lectures can be engaging, just because you put them together and ask them to talk does not mean that it's going to work, engage them, or be active at all. They know. And so if you're trying something new, you can kind of house it like this is new. If it blows up in your face, be honest with them. They're not dumb, right? I've had something blow up in my face, and I was like, so that didn't work at all, huh? And they're like, no. I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> it was new. We tried something new. That didn't work out very well. And they're like, OK, I'm like, we won't count those points. Don't worry, right? But you can, you can be honest with them about that. Um, here's the GPS stuff. Um, I have tons and tons of research on any and all of that. This is what we're going to ask you to do as part of that certificate program, is just to think about and reflect on student engagement motivation. So you can sort of take the active learning strategies and engaging lectures approach or the GPS mindset approach. Or if you're the overachieving student and want to think about both, that's fine. Um, but we just want you to reflect, because some of you, as we put in the note, you might already be doing this. Some of you already might know this stuff and be like, I've been doing this for years. Great. Highlight what you're doing. Some of you might have been doing this, but you didn't have the terms or the language for it. But you're like, yeah, I've been, I've been allowing for redos. I had no idea. I was promoting growth mindset with that, right? So you can describe it. And then others. This might be all brand new to you. You've never had these terms before. And you're like, that sounds great. How can I get this into my classroom? So we just want you to think about how you would get that stuff into your classroom. Questions on this little thing, Jane? Um, this, I love all these. And I have some experience doing them with smaller classes. I'm about to teach Psych 280, so a giant intro to stats class. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering about how to, I have some thoughts about how to translate this for larger classes, but I'm not going to do test reduce for a class of 120. No, you don't have to do test reduce. Like, just, uh, yeah, so I don't know, places, is the, the psych, the psych, the psych journal a good place to go or other places to get, to get resources for incorporating these in giant classes? Yeah, so in giant classes is asterisk there. Some people's giant class, right, like 120 might be giant, then 500 might be giant. So with stats and methods, we usually don't get the 500 seaters in psych. Um, but I have gotten you know, 90 to 120 for things like methods. And I will put them into smaller groups of four. 
maybe five, and have them do group work consistently with the same groups. I'll break them up into groups based on like research interest within the field. So I get my clinical psychologist there, my social psychologist there, my drugs folks here, my neuro folks here, my developmental folks there, so that there's a reason why I'm putting them together. But then these four people are working together, and instead of grading 80 papers, I'm grading right like 20 papers. Um, and so there's a little bit of that. With some of these things, you can do that. They can work on things together. They can check their own things. It couldn't be. Um, if they've done the assignment, they get the points, and then you post, like for things like stats, there might be an answer key. Right. Um, and so I would post an answer key and be like, well, everyone got it who was here to do it. Here's the answer key. You go grade your own paper. You could do some of that. Um, you also have TAs, but usually they run the lab. So, you know, some of that eh, can help. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Savannah. What programs exist that where we could do some of that like automatically? Let's say you wanted to do like an in-class quiz. Is there something they could do it online and automatically generate the grade and plug it in? Yeah, so I mean Canvas does all of that. So you can put the, the quizzing in Canvas. If you wanted to integrate poll everywhere, again, some of that could be like if you had something like stats or methods where there is a right answer. Here's a description. What design are they using? Experimental, quasi-experimental, non-experimental. So it's like A, B, C. It can they can do the poll everywhere on their device, and it will talk to Canvas and give them credit automatically. You have to work with ITS to get that to work. Because when I was doing it last year, sometimes it doesn't work. And I'm like, oh, this is frustrating. Um, but when it does work, it's beautiful. Is it training a one on poll everywhere? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, ITS, ITS is great. So it, you know, if you have it and you're working with it, you can always log into the faculty um, online help desk. Help, I did this thing, it's not working. They show you, like, they can usually fix your problems in really, really, really fast times. I mean, we have a lot. So ITS has a lot of services where they can teach you about all the ins and outs and the tricks of how you can get this to work in Canvas, how you can get this to work in Pull Everywhere. You say, here's what I want to do. And they're like, oh, here's the tool for you, right? So there's a lot of that. And then sometimes it's just a matter of you want them engaged in the classroom, but there's not points attached to it, right? And so you can do it that way, too. Other questions? OK, so as I promised, we're going to be really light on the programming. So we want you to spend, well, you can leave if you want. But otherwise, you can just chat with your colleagues, and you can share things that you have done or concerns that you have, or here's where I'm really struggling. I'm going to teach stats to 120. What do I do with them to get them active? Like I love stats and doing the M&M for statistical sampling. M&Ms are really fun. You get the little um, Halloween packs. And there is a distribution of colors on M&M's website. And you can see whether the pack is statistically different from their sample of M&Ms. True story, fun, fun, fun. They can do that with themselves, or they can, right? And I mean, really, you're out like. 15 bucks worth of M&Ms, but then they're all really happy that you gave them chocolate <laughs> to show them that like there's not enough blue M&Ms ever. It's kind of fun. I I want to ask some like specific like practical sure. question about like student engagement. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear like the collective feedback on like you know what people different people have done. So I teach a class from seven o'clock in the evening to oh. 9 40. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I teach two classes by 4 o'clock to 6 40 and then 7 o'clock to 9 40. Wow. There's a huge drop off in engagement yep. for the 7 o'clock class obviously. Mm -hmm. Most of these students are working full-time jobs and by yep. the time they come in like I feel like I'm doing everything I can but maybe I'm not but it's like it's it's like pulling teeth trying to just get one oh, yeah. answer for yeah. a question. So so I guess what have you? What are some different things that you've tried to get more engagement out of students in that kind of setting, in that kind of environment, where the students yeah. are naturally not going to be very prepared or engaged? Yeah. The other specific question I have was, how do you handle wrong answers? Because I Ooh. want students to be embarrassed. Yeah. And, but I still like I still want to encourage students to like take that chance mm -hmm. and like answer questions even if they're wrong just spit it out and just like yeah. that's still part of learning like growth mindset right so, yeah with the growth mindset that's a little bit easier I think to tackle first with the growth mindset you can you can say who else got that answer because 
honestly, if someone got it wrong, oftentimes someone else got it wrong too. And you can say, now how do we get to there? Or let's rewind that back. I see where you went and here's where it went wrong or here's how to get you back on track. Um, I don't think any answers are bad answers or dumb answers or dumb questions. So you can always sort of encourage that, DJ. I just want to add to that. Allison's response is great. It's growth mindset. As long as you're not shaming your student for the wrong answer, as long as you're encouraging them and thanking them for participating at 7 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I had a, a, an inspirational professor in undergrad who would say something positive about a wrong answer, and then in correcting the answer, I could tell he was going out of his way to use some of the words that the student yep. used in the wrong answer in the new answer. So he's like validating their effort, yep. even if he's only just sort of citing their vocabulary choices right. and redeploying those same words in the new context, which was additionally uh, a, a warm way of yeah. redirecting. Yeah. yeah. Brittany. I was just going to say along the lines of you know everything they said, uh, validating the answer is really important and also like thinking about your yes. mindset. So I don't think about growth mindset in the, set of, in the uh, circumstances of children or, or students because there's some equity issues with it but i do think a growth mindset as a as a reflection of me as the instructor so it's the way i see a wrong answer mm -hmm. like is it an opportunity for growth you know an opportunity for learning so think of it that way like there was some thought that went into that wrong answer and trying to figure out like where they're at and like you said other people probably have that same misconception and using that for an opportunity for learning mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, so when I was in grad school, they did like a teaching certificate program and it was called improv for teaching. Mm -hmm. and one of the techniques that we learned was yes and, right? Yep. And uh, I, I thought DJ would appreciate that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, and like I'm trying to apply those techniques, but sometimes it's like, oh gosh, I already know where this is going. Like I, the, the mental gymnastics that's like required for me to like, I don't know, like, oh, I yeah. have to, like, try to make it work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, it's, Yeah, it's, sometimes it's, you're like, that is just, all kinds of wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you are so wrong right now. Um, but let's get you wrong, right? Let's get you right on the other side. Yeah, but that, yeah, I think, and this is where you learn how to stretch your mental gymnastics <laughs> muscles. Because that's, I mean, that's what teaching is. Yeah. And you'll learn every semester from your students, you'll learn something new multiple things new. With regard to your first question, not just the 7 o'clock. Anyone who's got any long class, so if you've got the two hour, 40 minute once a week, yeah. that is the exact same struggle that everyone has, whether it's at night or in, I think people who have the 1230 to 145 time spot, oh my gosh, I don't function at that time. <laughs> like, my eyes just naturally are like, Phew. like, it, no matter what I'm doing, I, I could be talking to DJ and walking, that's about the only thing that keeps me awake because my body is just like, and it's time to go down. And I'm not a napper, right? But I think with regards to keeping them engaged, sometimes transparency and acknowledging, I know most of you are working adults and you can ask them, right? I give surveys to my students to be like, wow, 75% of you have a job and you work 45 hours on average? Whoa, that's a lot. Like acknowledging who they are helps with that sense of community building where you're seeing them as people, not just a number or red ID in your class. But also you want to think about the human attention span. And you want to think, I think in my class, in terms of 15 to 30 minute segments. So I try to keep them 15 to 20. But sometimes right, when I've taught health psych before, there's a chapter where we've just got to get through intro to physio. I've got to teach them all the systems of the body. And I'm like, there's no good way to do this. We're just going to lecture. I'm going to lecture at you for an hour and 10 minutes. I'm sorry ahead of time. Not sorry. Let's go. Boom. And then I'm like, now we don't have to ever do that again. Next time we're going to talk. Remember that digestive system? Yeah, of course you do. Now we're going to talk about the fun stuff, right? But I think in terms of like 15, 20 minute sections, so for your two hour 40, it's a lot of those sections. But can you open them up and get them going first? And then can you move into a lecture or a piece of you know external material like a video? Then can you move them to um, a dynamic activity where they're working together, then can you move them to a lecture or a break, and then can you pull them back? And it's not this sort of, use the term like bouncy ball, where you're just like, students are like, what is happening? This, this faculty is all over the place. But it's strategic. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to take a break. 
So that's about all our minds can do for that. And then we're going to come back and we're going to do these three things. We're going to try to hold our attention, and I know that it's hard. It's 9 o'clock. I get it. But you're here. I'm here. Let's try. And I think sometimes just acknowledging that helps. Because some faculty that teach those late night classes, they're like, I don't care that you've worked 40 hours. You're here. You're about to learn. I'm about to talk to you for two hours. And you're like, oh, great. Sounds like fun. I am by seven. I want to go home. Yeah. So. And you can tell them that. You can tell them that. I, th I think there's nothing wrong with telling them that. Yes. Yeah. Jane. Um, and I think I've also struggled to get people to talk sometimes. And one thing that if you can mix up the ways you get them to participate, so have them, instead of just like, you know, anyone raise your hand and contribute, like tell something to your neighbor instead of, you know, classroom wide or something I've done is, I forget what the software is called, but essentially like a Google Doc mm -hmm. where, rather than, you know, having to verbally spit things out, people can be just more comfortable writing things and then you see them all on the screen and you're projecting them and you can, you know, talk about what people are saying. Yeah. yeah. This is why this polling tool I think has the, the um, capacity to be really exciting for classes if you know what you're doing with it. Um, but like with the word clouds, every time you push space, it's a new word. And so if you want it to run together, you'll see the pop up if everyone's writing in sentences, which is a weird one. Um, so word clouds work for single word answers, right? Something like that. Otherwise, you want to get the, the kind of quotes, and then you see the quotes pop up and go through. But you know, giving them flexibility also helps with things like accessibility, which we'll talk about in two weeks. It helps with personality and anxiety. Right, um, and I'll tell them like, I don't like talking to strangers, but I'm asking you to try to make one friend. So just like sit next to someone who looks like that you can just talk to them. And I've had students open up that way where I've had multiple students on the spectrum who have no problem just raising their hand and being like, here's my sort of out there answer, but I feel comfortable enough in this class to raise my hand and give you that answer because I know that even though it's not maybe 100% right, you're going to find the parts of it that is right and validate that for me, and I'm still participating. right? You're trying to, to set up that, that psychological environment for your students. So giving them multiple ways to engage is always good. Discussion boards are good. Google Docs are good. Yeah. Would you ever um, just, like, I work with teenagers, and is a big issue, like, ever just contingency on time? So just say, like, I can see that I'm losing you. Mm -hmm. If we can get everyone to participate, we can end half an hour early. Yep. yep. Yeah. Always. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing in, you know, we're supposed to keep modality the way that it's written on the books. You don't want to shortchange your students, like, in terms of every class is let out early. But, you know, this is where we come back to on the slide, like, what is your goal for that day? And if you've met the goal and it's early, great. But also, sometimes, right, if you meet the goal, you want to then go on. So the yes and, you don't want to cut things out early. You know, you don't want to set the, the precedent for like, we're always going to get out early because then they're packing up and leaving. And you're like, we're not done. And they're like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm going. Yes? So I was mentioning this earlier when we were in the uh, initial group chat. Uh, so I created my entire class material. I did not adopt any book. And I made it in a way that it's supposed to be interactive. Mm -hmm. I teach computational science, so I made this that are called computational notebooks. So the students can actually input values, change numbers, and run experiments mm -hmm. with me. So the whole point was to have this uh, to be an interactive experience, like okay. a live demo or like a tutorial. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's so hard for me to actually get a sense if they are trying to. Mm -hmm. I think if it was like a web lab, if it was a chemistry lab, you can actually visually see people doing their experiments. But with the mm -hmm. computers, they can be working on their own stuff. They can be watching videos. Yeah. They can not like pay attention. And I don't want to walk around the classroom because it feels like really yeah. releasing and that's not what I want to do. Uh, so I try some of these, but I may, I may have to try other like techniques. Like I ask them questions. I ask them, you know, for their participation. I did put participation down in the in the grade mm -hmm. at five percent or something. 
I just don't know what else to do to make sure that they are following and like really playing along. That was the mm -hmm. intent of the class material. I mean, off the top of my head, you could just have them work in pairs because it's really hard for two to go off and not do what you're asking them to do. Um, one might not be paying attention, but when we're working together, especially if there's any grade associated. I don't want you to lose points because I'm not paying attention, and I hope you don't want me to lose points because you're not doing your work, but if we're doing it together, sometimes you put that sort of peer pressure, that social responsibility in, and that might be enough to kick it. Yeah. And right? Polls. Yeah. yeah. And some of it is just transparency. I keep looking at a slide that isn't there. Um, some of it is just transparency. I created this for you so that you can learn to do this. This will help solidify those concepts for you. You won't learn it until you actually start doing the computational experiments. So I need you to engage with this stuff. And maybe after one, you've got it. Maybe after five, you still don't have it. But this is why I've done this for you. Like I explain why all the time until I'm blue in the face. Students go with me where I ask them to go because I'm telling them I'm doing this for you. I'm asking you to do this for you. Yeah. Oh. Nope. It's like a finger. All right. Well, I appreciate all of your time and attention. It's still all you can eat. So if you need more cupcakes or cake or soup or meatloaf, um, I've heard that was really good today. Um, by all means, grab what you need. We're still here. So if you've got questions for us one on one, we're here. And then if you want to just keep talking to each other, and then we'll see you again in two weeks. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.